Okay, everyone, good afternoon. Maybe we should get started. Thank you for joining us today in this ECB panel on aggregate and distributional effects of high inflation. The title is um, self-explanatory. After a couple of decades of very low and stable inflation, here in Europe and elsewhere in the world, we are experiencing a burst of high inflation. Um, it's really remarkable how much the world has changed in this regard over just a few years. Just from personal experience, um, I took a leave from academia and joined the ECB research department in 2018. And we were just remembering that back then the problem was that inflation was too low, couldn't go up to 2%. And the concern was that inflation expectations uh, might become an anchor from below. So I'm originally from Argentina. This is like the world upside down. Uh, well, now the world is back to normal, at least. <laughs> Um, so as economists, we're now forced to think, again, about the consequences of high and persistent inflation for economic activity, for distributional um, issues, because not everyone is affected the same, for agents' expectation formation, and ultimately, I think, for the credibility of monetary policy. And luckily, we have with us today a wonderful panel to help us think um, about these issues. Okay, so we have um, with us today Anna Bremann, who is first deputy director of the Sveriges Riksbank, the Swedish central bank, Pablo Hernández de Cos, who is governor of the Bank of Spain, and Ricardo Reis, who is Arthur William Phillips, professor of economics at the London School of Economics. And so the way this panel will proceed is each one of them will give us a presentation of about 12 minutes, give or take. And then after that, um, we will let them reflect on each other's views, and if time permits, we will take questions from the audience. So you should be thinking about really insightful stuff to ask them uh, towards the end of the panel. And with that, I'll give the floor to Anna, who will be our first presenter. Hello to everyone, and thank you so much for inviting me here. I, I feel like I really have to start by congratulating Spain on your amazing victory in the Football World Cup. <laughs> uh, I can say that our central bank, when the semi-final, Sweden was playing Spain, and we had the match, the game on big screen televisions, the productivity was relatively low, and we were really sad to see that our team lost, but your team was amazing. Congratulations. Um, unfortunately, when it comes to inflation, uh, you're also leading uh, right now. Uh, we're, we're still at a high rate of inflation. Uh, but of course, um, uh, inflation has turned in Sweden, and I'm confident that it will continue to do so. Uh, I would like to start today uh, by illustrating what I hope is a well-known fact, and that is with high inflation, we also tend to get a lot of volatility in inflation. So this is inflation in Sweden in the 70s and 80s. Uh, the average was over 8%, and the standard deviation was close to 3 And after inflation targeting was introduced in the early 1990s, inflation has been much more close to target, and variability had been considerably lower. Um, you know the current situation. Of course, our task right now is to bring inflation back to target, but also to ensure that when it's back at target, it stays low and stable. And this, I think, is an illustration of why high and variable inflation is so costly to society. During the 70s and 80s, we didn't see, despite very high nominal wage growth, any real income growth for households. Well, during this period of low and stable inflation, we've had Real wage growth for all the years up until last year when inflation took off again. So today I'd like to focus on three aspects of high and volatile inflation that are related. The first one is the distributional effects, the fact that with high inflation, the differences across households, the actual inflation rates that they face tend to increase. Uh, also, when inflation is high, we tend to get more variance in inflation expectations. And finally, I'd like to discuss a little bit the difference between how households perceive inflation and how we in the central bank community tend to talk about it. 
And my argument is that if there's too big difference between how we analyze and communicate inflation and how households perceive it, that could in the longer run be an issue for central bank credibility. So let me start with trying again to illustrate the divergence in inflation rates across households. So this is using data uh, from Statistics Sweden. So what they've done is they've construed different inflation rates for different types of households. So this is supposed to reflect a typical family with children, a retired couple, and a student. Uh, and then you also have CPI, um, uh, the average um, inflation. And you can see when inflation was low and stable, there were some differences across households, but as inflation has risen, so has the divergence across households. So in particular, you can notice when inflation peaked at the end of last year, a typical family with children had almost twice the cost uh, of living increases compared to a retired couple. But of course, you have to take this with a little bit of grain of salt, because in reality, the variance just within the categories of family with children would be larger than I'm showing you at the graph. Um, does this matter for monetary policy? Well, it matters if households have different um, compensities to consume and to save. It could matter for inflation expectations, and inflation expectations will also matter. We know that for households' propensity to consume and save. Um, but it can also matter because, as I said, central bank communication, when we're talking and people are listening when inflation is low and stable, well, most households are facing relatively similar worldview. They're facing similar rates of inflation. But when inflation goes up, and we keep on stressing the averages, well, some people's experience is not at all the one that we are talking about. Um, so what do we know about households inflation expectation and the channels through inflation expectations? Well, from research, we actually know quite a lot. So there has been, oh, sorry. Um, there's been quite a lot of research looking into households inflation expectations. And that research tends to show that households focus on prices that are rising more than those that are falling, prices that are changing a lot, but also prices of goods or services that are purchased frequently. So basically, households tend to focus on goods and services that are very salient to them, typically food and energy. And you know that because of Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, food and energy prices have risen remarkably fast in the euro area as well as in Sweden. And this is again um, inflation average for Sweden and the euro area, CPIF, that's our target variable. It's just CPI but with fixed interest rates to take out the effects of our own changes in policy rates. Um, this is food inflation, relatively similar in Sweden and the euro area, considerably higher than average inflation. And here is energy prices. Um, so we know that this is likely to affect households' inflation expectations. However, when we in the central bank community, uh, we tend to stress measure of underlying inflation, core inflation, that typically exclude uh, food and energy prices. And for monetary policy, this makes sense. We have to look at various measures of inflation. Core inflation is very important to look at the persistence of inflation. Um, but it had the issue when inflation started rising late 2021, and I'm only talking for my own case, my own central bank, we did underestimate the large indirect effect, in particular from energy prices to other price categories. And we also have the issue that if we focus too narrowly on core inflation, many households might be wondering, what's the point of measuring cost of living increases, inflation, when you exclude the cost for feeding your family, or when you exclude the cost for heating your home in a cold Swedish winter, or cooling your house during a heat wave in Spain in the summertime? So my concern is that if the gap between how households perceive inflation, actually live inflation, and how we communicate about it, that might affect um, well, inflation expectations, but also the credibility for central banks. So what's happened to inflation expectations? Here you have, 
a number of measures. I don't expect you to look into the details of all of them, but it's households, it's firms, and it's market-based expectations at different time horizons. And for the market-based um, expectations, it's both surveys and derived from the pricing in financial markets. And inflation expectations have a high prominence in central bank analysis and communication. Currently, I would say there is a revival of the discussion on inflation expectations. And the questions that's been raised in research recently are things like which agency expectations matter the most? Is it households, firms, or market participants? Are short or longer term uh, expectations the most important? Or are they important at all for future inflation? Some people question that. And does higher expected inflation have an expansionary or contractionary effect on the real economy? I'm really encouraged to see uh, the amount of new research coming out uh, on these issues. Of course, I encourage you to read all the recent papers by Ricardo on this topic. Um, I think also I'd like to recommend, if you want a fast overview of all this literature, the paper that Silvana Tenreiro and her co-author presented at the ECB forum at Sintra gives a really good overview. And some of these papers, they argue that because of the inconclusiveness of the research on inflation expectations, we should be careful and not pay too much attention to inflation expectations when setting monetary policy. For my part, uh, when I go through this research, uh, I would caution against caution against, um, if, you know, not looking enough on inflation expectations. I do definitely think that we need to focus on uh, inflation expectations, and we should look at all these different kinds of measures and right now, as a researcher, uh, you get quite a lot of variance in the data that might help you uh, find some new conclusions. Um, we should also look, I want to stress, at all different measures. Firms are important, they're price setters, sometimes price takers, but clearly price setters uh, once in a while. Uh, households uh, are important through wage bargaining and through the effect that inflation expectation has on their consumption and savings decisions. Uh, but market participants are also important uh, for financial conditions, of course. Uh, I would also like to stress that I think that the ones that are the mo most under-researched are households. So households tend to be overlooked. And if you look at this graph, you can kind of understand a bit why. Well, households tend to overestimate inflation, even when it's low and stable. Um, they tend to um, have too high inflation expectations. So when you look at the research, you can see that professional forecasters, they tend to do better, but at least so when inflation is low and stable. But as Ricardo has recently pointed out, this is not necessarily true when you're going from a low to a high inflation environment. Then households has actually been better uh, in terms of forecasting future inflation. And again, coming back to communication, uh, if households' inflation expectations are more important in a world with high and volatile inflation, we as central bankers need to consider how we communicate towards households. So normally, because we know that markets tend to react quickly uh, when we do a speech or when we set policy, and we also know from research that households don't tend to react that much to central bank communication. A lot of central bank communication is actually focused on steering financial markets. But that's a dangerous path when inflation is high and volatile. Uh, so let me summarize but give you some things that I would like uh, that would be very informative as a policymaker setting monetary policy in this well challenging environment. Uh, one thing I would like to see is actually has central bank changed their communication during the since the surge in inflation? Have we started to talk more to the general public or have we changed the way we're talking to try to anchor uh, short and long-term inflation expectations? Of course, I think all research on inflation expectations are highly relevant and important. I'd like to see more, in particular on households, but all, all research is welcome. And i also like to see, I'm really heartened to see the development of the Hank models. I think that's very important for us, and particularly in these kind of situations when the old data um, is giving less information about how households are responding in a new environment. So let me conclude just by saying that High and volatile inflation is costly to society. The distributional effects are large. What we can do is to incorporate the latest research into our models and try to improve efficiency uh, of transmission. We think we have to communicate more to the general public. Um, 
But most importantly, of course, to reduce the distributional effects is to get inflation back down to target. And I'm confident that we will get there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Our next speaker is uh, Pablo Hernandez de Cos. And, uh, and Ricardo, which is always a, a pleasure. Uh, I will be putting the focus in my intervention to one of the topics uh, that have been mentioned by Bayana, uh, which is uh, the link between inflation and, uh, and inequality, uh, or in other words, uh, how inflation affects and redistributes wealth across uh, households. I think we all know that people, uh, we are um, afraid of inflation because it makes us uh, poorer, but at the same time, we also know that uh, these effects are not at all homogeneous, and I think it's important for many dimensions, in particular also from a macro perspective, to, to look at whether this uh, heterogeneity uh, really uh, matters. Uh, I will start uh, by describing the, the three main channels uh, through which uh, an unexpected, uh, and I will emphasize unexpected because Later on, I will talk uh, about um, how uh, these uh, results I'm going to mention are affected uh, when the inflation episode is more persistent, as it's currently the case in the euro area. Um, how an unexpected increase in inflation can affect an individual's wealth. And in the literature, you can find that there are basically three main channels. The first one is, of course, inflation redistributes real wealth from lenders to borrowers. Uh, and uh, this is uh, done basically by changing the real value of nominal assets and liabilities, as this is what it is called the Fisher effect or, uh, uh, or, the, or, the, or the Fisher channel or the wealth uh, channel. By real, um, here I mean nominal wealth in euros or, or in dollars, for example, expressed in units uh, of a basket of consumer goods and services. Uh, uh, in other words, this is um, uh, basically nominal wealth rescale. Uh, by the level of uh, uh, consumer uh, prices. And uh, therefore, the impact of inflation on real wealth is fully or should be fully captured by the net nominal position, defined as the difference between uh, your assets and, uh, and your liabilities. Uh, and of course, while inflation will reduce both uh, the real value of uh, liabilities and assets, the net effect on a given household will depend on uh, the, the, the share of these uh, assets and liabilities. Okay, this is the first channel. The second channel is, of course, uh, uh, nominal um, income, and um, it's referring to the literature normally as, as the income channel. Uh, nominal income sources, uh, we know, in particular wages, for example, move slowly. In most uh, advanced economies, they are uh, sticky, and therefore, during, uh, in particular during an initial phase, unexpected high inflation episodes uh, tend to reduce the real value of uh, nominal income and consequently of real wealth. However, um, wages and other sources of, uh, of income may evolve differently across uh, workers, for example, or across citizens in general. Um, while, for example, in many countries, some sources of income, uh, for example, pensions, are indexed, at least exposed uh, to, to inflation. And this, of course, uh, can also have an uh, impact on, on, on inequality. Uh, and the third factor um, is derived from the fact that inflation does not typically affect all prices homogeneously. Um, and a good example is, for example, inflation in Spain in, let's take one year, 2021. Uh, inflation was mainly driven by energy prices, more than 50%, around 54% 50 per, uh, of um, the rising CPI in Spanish CPI in 21 was derived because of, uh, of energy. Given uh, that individuals of different ages, uh, income levels and wealth typically consume different baskets uh, of goods and services, uh, an increase 
in price status heterogeneously distributed across uh, these goods and services will impact those uh, individuals uh, differently. Um, um, in particular, for those who consume a higher share of goods and services that are experiencing larger price increases, their individual inflation rate or expenditure adjusted inflation rate uh, will, be, uh, will be higher and will uh, be affected disproportionately in relative terms as compared to other uh, consumers. Uh, and we may label this uh, as the relative consumption uh, channel. So this is, um, let's say, the, the theoretical uh, framework that I will be using. Let me now focus on uh, tr uh, trying to uh, quantify these effects uh, for the Spanish case in only one year, 2021, and I emphasize this only for one year. This is uh, an exercise that was done by researchers at the Bank of Spain together with researchers uh, from BBVA, uh, the, the, bank, the Spanish uh, private bank, drawing on customers level commercial bank information uh, that uh, was used in order to um, uh, have information on uh, transactions, but also on labor-related income and also on asset and uh, liability uh, positions. And uh, the, the authors uh, were able to quantify uh, the, the three channels I've just mentioned for Spain 2021, uh, the first year of the current inflationary episode. Um, and there are basically two main uh, conclusions that uh, these conclusions emerge for the chart uh, that I'm showing in this uh, slide. First one, and this uh, can be shown on the left-hand uh, side uh, uh, chart, uh, on average, both uh, the Fisher and the income channels turn out to be uh, of one order of magnitude uh, higher, larger, than the relative income, uh, uh, sorry, the relative consumption channel. And this is basically because uh, the heterogeneity in consumption baskets play a smaller role in that uh, year. Um, also, uh, was a combination, of course, that the heterogeneity of uh, the price increases of different uh, elements in the, in the consumption basket was not sufficiently heterogeneous, or, uh, of course, and the combination with that the, uh, the heterogeneity in the consumption basket of individuals they didn't give uh, much larger uh, results. Um, the second uh, uh, element, uh, or the second conclusion, is that the magnitudes of both the Fisher and the income channels are uh, comparable in absolute value, as can be seen in the, in the blue uh, column uh, and the uh, red column uh, in, this, uh, in this chart. Um, however, through, and this is very important in, when you are looking at heterogeneity, the income channel inflation reduces the real wealth of most households, while through the Fisher channel it increases the real wealth uh, of net debtors and reduces that of net uh, creditors, and uh, is there where you can uh, get most of the impact on heterogeneity and, and, and inequality. So if I, I move now to the right-hand chart, what you uh, see there is uh, just, uh, I will just uh, point to one of the main results, is that when you look only to 2021, um, what you observe is that middle-aged individuals, uh, those between 36 and uh, 45 years of age, were largely unaffected by or even benefited uh, from the rise in inflation uh, in, in this year, as they typically have relatively high mortgage debt and therefore large negative net nominal uh, positions. And in contrast, uh, older people experience the largest decline in real wealth as they uh, very often uh, have large positive uh, nominal uh, positions. So this is, uh, these were the main results for uh, unexpected inflation uh, spike uh, for one uh, year. Let me now introduce uh, at least three caveats to these results that are uh, absolutely uh, uh, crucial if we want to analyze uh, this uh, deeper. The first uh, caveat that I want to, uh, to mention is that these results apply to the Spanish case, but they should not be automatically um, generalized to other countries. And the fact is that uh, the International Monetary Fund made a very similar exercise that was published in the spring uh, this year in the uh, fiscal uh, monitor. And they follow exactly the same methodology to analyze the impact of these uh, three channels, uh, income, wealth, and consumption, of course, on a wider uh, sample of countries, uh, including advanced but also emerging countries' uh, economies. And the results for the same episodes, looking only to 2021, vary widely depending, of course, on um, each country's economic conditions and also on institutions. Okay, that's, that's a, very, a very important point. The second point I wanted to, uh, to mention is, of course, uh, and I've been referring to this um, uh, a lot in, 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 my, in, my, in my initial uh, remarks, is that these estimates capture only the effect of unexpected inflation during the first year. Okay? 
but of course they cannot capture and they do not capture the subsequent adjustments of, in individuals' balance sheets through, for example, asset prices, uh, indexation of uh, some uh, sources of income, for example, pensions, I was referring uh, before, or of course other benefits or, or wages, uh, or, um, uh, of course, also important changes uh, in consumption baskets that might occur uh, over time. Uh, and this is particularly uh, important, uh, as I was referring at the, at the beginning, when the inflation episode persists, as has been the case, and it's still uh, the, the, the case. Um, in, in fact, interest, uh, inflation rates was mar were much higher in 2022 than in 2021. So let me try to illustrate this, uh, this point. Uh, by referring to just one of the channels, which is the, um, the consumption one, um, as inflation intens intensified in Spain and become more persistent, and the role of differences in consumption bas baskets can become, and in fact, were more important. Um, in particular, uh, although the impact of inflation through the relative consumption channel, as I've just mentioned, was relatively small during 2021, as in, uh, inflation uh, subsequently intensified this effect, increased, and was even uh, become correlated with uh, the income channel. Okay, that is also an interesting uh, result. Basically, poorer households experience higher expenditure adjusted inflation rates due uh, to the composition of their consumption basket as they spend proportionally more on energy and also food, and food also was a, a, an important origin of inflation, not in 2021, but yes, in 2022. And in, in particular, in, or in addition to this, uh, these uh, poor uh, households, we have also evidence that they face greater difficulties in modifying their com, uh, consumption patterns over, over time. Of course, it, it makes it more difficult for them if the inflation persists on, on one particular item on which they have a, a lot of weight in, in the consumption basket, basket to modify to, to lower, uh, to lower uh, prices. And these two features uh, have accentuated uh, the asymmetric impact of inflation through uh, this channel by hitting relatively vulnerable uh, households uh, harder. And here, what you have in this uh, chart is basically by income percentile, but also by age, the inflation, the specific inflation of, uh, of different uh, groups, um, both for 2021 and 2022. I will not refer to the specific numbers, but uh, just if you sum up and you consider 2021 and 2022 20, uh, jointly, the gap in household specific inflation rates between the bottom and top uh, quartiles of the income distribution was almost uh, two uh, percentage uh, points, which is, uh, is material. Uh, and if you uh, move now to the right part of the, of the chart, when, uh, is where you get uh, the age distribution, the gap between the inflation rate experience by younger and older households was also of a similar uh, magnitude. Uh, on this particular uh, um, dimension, on, age, on the age dimension, it's of course important also to, to mention that uh, some sources, and in particular pensions, as I was mentioning before, are fully indexed to inflation exposed. Uh, in, in many countries, of, co of course, also in Spain, while wages, we also know that adjust and have adjusted only partially uh, to inflation, and uh, this would uh, have helped to reduce the above uh, mentioned age gap through the, the income uh, effect. So again, this is a new uh, element that uh, provides evidence that we have to, to look at this not only uh, on, on a point of time, but also uh, over time, if we want to have the, the full picture of the impact of inflation on uh, inequality. Um, the, the last element that I wanted to, to, to mention, and with this I will, I will end, is of course that these estimates uh, do not include the uh, policy responses. And here there were mainly two uh, policy responses. The first one it was fiscal policy, and in most governments uh, have enacted many uh, measures during the last uh, two years and a half that uh, among many other goals, uh, but they, w they wanted, they, they pursued basically to, to reduce the impact of inflation on, on households, also on firms, but particularly on, on households. And of course, we have also to take into account if we want to look at the impact of inflation on inequality, of course, the potential effect and effect of uh, monetary policy, which can also uh, have impact on, 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 on inequality. So what do we know um, of these uh, potential effects, I will only uh, try to illustrate some of the points. Uh, as to the, the impact of poli fiscal policy measures, this was analyzed for the Spanish case also by economists at the Bank of Spain. And the main conclusion that they draw uh, from this analysis is that the impact of these fiscal policy measures on 
inequality crucially uh, depends on whether these measures are sufficiently targeted uh, to the hardest uh, heat uh, agent. So the question is, were they sufficiently targeted to the uh, hardest uh, heat agents? Well, the answer is that the, the bulk uh, the most part of the public uh, actions adopted in Spain, also, by the way, in the rest of the Euro area countries since late 2021, um, appear to have benefited uh, Spanish households across the board. So they were not uh, sufficiently uh, targeted. And specifically, I can give you even a, a figure, measures targeting the economic agents most vulnerable to the energy crisis uh, and rising prices account for around between 15% to 20% of the estimated overall budgetary cost in the period running from 2021 to 2025. As to the impact of uh, the monetary policy response, um, again, the evidence available for Spain shows that this can also have very uh, heterogeneous uh, effects across uh, households. Um, the effects uh, of higher interest rates on households wealth and, and income are uneven across households, as they depend, among other factors, on their level uh, whether first whether they are indebted or not, uh, the level of their indebtedness, uh, the type of debt, whether they have floating or, 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 or fixed uh, rate uh, debts, their financial and real asset uh, holdings. And we know that all these factors tend to vary by income uh, level. Uh, so again, let me just uh, give you um, a number that illustrates how important these uh, uh, effects can, can be. The, um, well, this was also estimated by economists at the bank, the pass-through of uh, higher interest rates to the average cost of uh, Spanish household debt. Um, uh, the, 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 the numbers are that a four uh, percentage points increase in the market uh, rate, uh, which is basically uh, what it has uh, been generated in the market through the, the, the actions of the European Central Bank during the last uh, year and a half, raises uh, their, uh, the household's net interest expenses by, but, uh, by between 1.1% for low-income households and 2.2% uh, for uh, high-income households of their income. 1.1 and 2.2 percent of the income. Um, um, and why is so? Well, why here the impact of monetary policy was lower for low income households is basically for two reasons. Um, lower proportion of indebted households uh, in lower income percentiles, that's the first uh, element. And second, that uh, the proportion of households with floating rate loans uh, was uh, in, in low income households was also uh, lower. 30% um, for the total population, um, around 11% for households with income below the 20th uh, percentile. So let me just uh, uh, briefly con conclude. I think all these uh, fundies, uh, I, I should have mentioned that uh, at least five papers have been published at the Bank of Spain on this issue of inequality and inflation during the last year and a half. Um, and I think all of them um, highlight um, that this is important, that an inflation surge has heterogeneous effects on households' real wealth, depending on balance sheet composition, the level and sensitivity of nominal income sources, and differences in the composition of expenditure. Second point, uh, consumption baskets, uh, as well as the ability to shift spending across uh, items in response to shocks, vary again across households and tend to be significantly, this is important, correlated with income and uh, with age. Third, uh, as inflation becomes uh, more persistent than expected, the relative importance of these channels could vary over time. Uh, households will naturally start to shift their asset portfolios and their consumption baskets away from assets whose value is fixed in nominal terms and from goods or services whose prices uh, increases are above, uh, above uh, average. In addition, we also know wage negotiations will gradually incorporate compensation for past and also expected uh, price increases, while some uh, sources of income, such as pension, uh, will be fully compensated, exposed. Uh, and uh, this is also very important in terms of the potential long-term impact on, on, on inequality. The ability to carry out such adjustments vary across households in ways that can affect uh, how such a shock is transmitted to the, to the economy as a, as a whole. On fiscal policy, four point, uh, again, fiscal policy can help to counterbalance these heterogeneous effects on households, but only if they are targeted uh, sufficiently to the hardest hit agents. And here, uh, let me also, of course, uh, mention that uh, 
if we want to improve uh, the design of public policy, it's absolutely crucial uh, that we, we combine the information available from, uh, on household income, on household uh, wealth, and also on household uh, expenditure. No? So have the, all this information available and available to researchers, is part and of course to policymakers, is particularly uh, relevant. And of course, finally, monetary policy response can also have very heterogeneous effects across households, and in the uh, Spanish uh, case, uh, this is particularly the case uh, with a significant larger impact on indebted households with floating uh, rate loans that, as you know, uh, is one of the characteristics that distinguishes Spain as compared to other Euro area countries. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Our last speaker is uh, Ricardo Reis. Great. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I want to, uh, in this talk, ask a really big question. And when it comes to really big questions, the only, there's only re two possible answers, either I don't know or it depends. <laughs> Those are the only possible answers. However, thankfully, economic research, such as the one that I have seen across rooms over the last three days that I've been in this meeting, allows us to make progress on these big questions because it allows one to ask smaller but sharper questions through the help especially of economic theorists. It allows us to start discussing the mechanisms that could inform those questions, even if without fully answering, through the help of our applied economists, and finally quantify with numbers what the actual answers are to make a little bit of progress to it depends from, it depends, I don't know, to it depends, here's a confidence interval uh, with the help of our econometricians. And so what I'm going to try to do is precisely go after a big question in a much narrower way, isolating some mechanisms and putting some numbers behind them, mostly informed certainly by my own research of the last few years, um, as is inevitable. And the question I want to ask is, what is the long run level that we should expect for the interest rate set, say, by the ECB, since we're in Europe? Uh, over the last 12, 18 months, we have seen a large increase there in the blue line on the deposit rate that the ECB pays to banks at deposit institution. We're now at 3.75%. Is that the new normal? Should we expect interest rates to be around 3.75? Certainly, for those of you a little bit on the younger side, you think, well, between 2012 and 22, the average interest rates at the ECB were approximately 0%. This seems like a lot bigger than normal. Those who are just a little bit older, though, will remember that between 99 and 2008, the average interest rate was around 3%, in which case, yeah, we're kind of pretty much around there what the normal is. But of course, the past is a terrible way to figure out what the normal is. Uh, you really want to be forward-looking and think of what it should be and where it is heading as opposed to where it was. And one way to do so is that I put here the Fed in red because at the Fed, the members of the FOMC answer regularly where they think the federal funds rate will be in 10 years. And they've pretty much gone through the last, um, I put here just the last couple of years, but really for a very long time, saying we think we're going to be back at roughly 2.5%. How do we think about those 2.5%? There's roughly three components of where I star, I being the universal letter for nominal interest rates, star to mention some long-run level will be. Those three components are that I star, we can think about it as a sum of an R star, a, re a real return on investments in the economy, over which in the long run, Phil vertical Phillips curve dicks it, you should have little influence, zero influence, although probably you do have a little bit of influence. Pi star, the expected inflation in the long run, which hopefully should coincide with the inflation target of the central bank. And then RP standing here for a risk premium associated especially with the inflation side of the economy. Now, pre-pandemic estimates, starting with the US, were that R star had fallen to roughly around 0 0.5. Again, add plus and minus 0.5 to that. Pi star was certainly 2% the target. And estimates of the risk of inflation alternate between 0 and 0 0.2, which are added to 0 just because of digital preferencing over there. So you end up with roughly the 2.5%. On the Eurozone, there was a perception that R star was about 1% lower, and therefore 1.5 was roughly the normal average where we were going at. Uh, if you had asked, I think, many people around 2019 and 2020. How has this changed? With high and volatile inflation, the topic of this, of this, uh, of this panel. 
Well, to start with, let's start with who won and lost in financial markets through this inflation boom. In work with Salim Bahaj, Robert Cech, and Si Tong Ding at the Bank of England, we've been looking at the inflation swap market where you can buy insurance against episodes of high inflation to discover who was, and in following on Maristella Botticini's presidential address, we have insurance against inflation, not just shipping, uh, not just ships through uh, the Mediterranean in the 14th century. Nowadays, we actually insure against what inflation was high. And before inflation started rising, there were people buying and selling that insurance. Those people report that, and here we are from the repository of inflation swaps, who was buying and who was selling insurance starting in January 2019 until January 21. Why until January 21? Because this is Bank of England data, and Brexit came along, and it turns out that now a lot of this gets straight in Frankfurt, and so you see a huge break in my series. Some of it still gets straight in London, and so pay special attention to the January 21 one. Colleagues at the ECB could do this work post-January 21. I start going from having almost a universe, because all inflation swaps are traded in London until then, to now some of them are traded not just in London when it comes to European inflation. And the short answer is that banks, for about a decade, I could have extended this further, uh, sold insurance against inflation, collected a very nice premium, just like the, some of the merchants in Maristella's talk. And on the other side, pension funds for the most part, a lot of the others there are life insurance companies in Europe, bought protection against inflation. What that meant is that over the last year and a half, banks lost money, pension funds and life insurance made money, uh, in so, made money so far as I got paid for that insurance, uh, for that insurance that they had bought. Interestingly, hedge funds, in yellow there, were pretty much neutral, but they seem to have been the first to catch on to the persistence of inflation early in early 2021, and they've been making very good money ever since. But what's the impact of this redistribution of wealth and who makes and loses money in these markets? What it leads to is a reassessment of where they think expected inflation will be based on their recent losses, as well as their reuptake of where they think the risk of inflation are. The five-year five year expected inflation in the euro area, so instead of looking to the past, let's look into the future and see what financial markets are thinking of where inflation is going, has been rising, as you might expect, since 2021, and rising, and rising, and rising, to the point where now it's a little bit above 2.5%, dangerously getting closer to 3% than 2 Five-year, five-year is a wonderful measure because you basically go into the price of a 10-year inflation con swap contract, which pretty much mimics expected inflation. You look at the five-year, well, 10 minus five gives you the five, five, and so you subtract those two expectations, obviously adjusting for the relevant horizons, and you end up with what they think inflation is gonna be after this whole episode is over. And so that has been increasing, and that you can get, this was from even the FT just a few days ago, I took this picture. Uh, but you really can't take these pictures at face value for a series of reasons. The first reason is that you need to look at what's behind this, this mean, what is behind this expected inflation. Is it being driven by the right tail, the left tail, or others? And in work over the last couple of years with the Hans Hill Journal on Revive, we've been developing the methods to go from option prices on those swaps into actual probabilities of what inflation will be. A very important adjustment here, which is only applies to inflation options, not to the equity and interest rate options that the literature is developed on, is that when inflation is high, if I've bought insurance against inflation, good news, I get paid. But bad news is because that euro is worth less. And that leads to a very important adjustment that leads to a lot of the literature, I think, up until I think a year ago when we wrote our paper, getting a lot of these probabilities very wrong because you had forgot the fact that high inflation is, diminishes your return. There's also a need for adjustments for risk and adjustments of horizon, which are a little bit longer to explain and so I will have to skip. But when you do those adjustments, what you see is that when we, through this inflation process, it's really been a shift in distribution with mass on the right tail and no real change over the last six months, that's the blue and the orange one. That is that the increase in inflation, expected inflation on the average, has been driven by a fear that inflation will be higher on the upside. Now, a second thing is you want to distinguish or you want to look at the risk premium together with the expected inflation part because those measures included both. And on that, that is very hard. There's an entire literature, most of finance in some ways is trying to measure risk premium. 
But when it comes to inflation risk, there's two things that one can use. This is current work that I'm doing in my colleague Ian Martin. Is that on the one hand, I can separate the risk that comes from inflation alone from the risk that comes from covariance of inflation with market returns. And when it comes to the covariance of market returns, we have previous work by Ian on putting bounds on that risk. And when it comes to the risk on inflation, we can also come with bounds on it from precisely the options that I showed you on the previous figure. And when it does that bounds, what ends up with, depending on the horizon, as well as how bold or conservative you want to be on those bounds, and that's what those formula tell you, uh, that, tell, that point to risk pyramid inflation have increased by around 0.1% if you look at the conservative ones to 0.25%. In other words, those guys who lost money, the dealer banks, if you want, and the others, are now putting a higher risk that inflation will uh, be high. The right tail, those outcomes of high inflation, they're requiring a little bit more risk compensation. Next comes liquidity premium, very important. And so in the work that I've been doing at, with Salim, Rob, and Tong at the Bank of England, we've been trying to look and estimate market structure, demand and supply functions for those dealers and those buyers, both at short run and long run horizon markets uh, in, this, uh, in this protection for inflation risk. And what we're finding is that at the short term, fundamentals account for at most 20% of that risk, whereas in the long run, they account for almost as much as 80%. What that means is that when you do it something like a five-year, five-year, you have a lot of liquidity noise in the, five, in the first five and much less in the other ten. And as a result, that adjustment can get quite distorted by uh, the presence of this liquidity premium. Okay? What that means is that when you look at measures, especially at the shorter horizon, and let me focus you here on the right-hand side, what you have is that the market price is very much overshoot what the fundamental is. In other words, a little bit of good news to Pablo there, that increase in the five-year, five-year is an overstatement by something like 20 to 30 basis points, having to do with just the pressure in the market of more people wanting to buy protection against inflation and dealer banks being limited in their risk ability to supply this. That pushes the price of the insurance up and leads to a misleading increase in the perceived expected inflation in the future, which therefore should subtract for you from what you saw before. So, Moving to the last point, we've done the pi E, we've done the, or the pi star, we've done the RP. Let me now talk about the R star. Of course, the great fact of the last 20 years has been that decline in R star in government bonds across the whole G7 or even the advanced economies by as much as three, four percentage points. At the same time, though, there's been a coincident fact, which is during that time, the return on private investment in these economies much harder to measure than simply reading off rate on government bond, it's been approximately stable. Approximately, because it's much harder to measure. But at the same time, because this is coming from measuring it by using national income accounts, just look at net operating surpluses divided by the total amount of the capital stock, and then do a lot of hard work to deal with trends on price of investment, trends in appreciation, trends in the size of intangibles and others. And either way you do it, you don't end up with anything like a big decline like the one we see in government bonds. So a part of the decline in the R star in government bonds, which is the important one for our I star question, is really not matched by a change in, investment, in private investment, which tells you there's something about the gap between the two that we need to make sense of. What that meant was that in the last few years, what that has implied is that governments in the last 20 years have won a lot. Not redistribution across households like Pablo showed, but rather redistribution across governments in the private sector, governments have been able to sustain a large increase in public debt by paying a lot less than private investors uh, would have gotten if you were to borrow. And that has been the big explanation for why we've been running deficits for 20 years, and yet the difference between the M or the R sum private investment and the R sum government bonds has allowed us to pay for it. What drove it? Well, we had all of these people in Southeast Asia, these countries, growing fast, having large trade surpluses, wanting to save it, and not really wanting to save it in a wonderful Spanish firm, but rather preferring to buy a Spanish government bond. We had post great financial crisis regulation, making it hard to take on risk, and putting a big premium on the liquidity of government bonds that we pledged as collateral and others. 
And we had, of course, the stagnation of private investment and the decline in productivity growth, together with austerity in public investment, leading to less investment demand for savings and having government bonds pick up the remainder. But what happens as we look forward? As we look forward, what we see in the last six, nine months with the increase in geopolitical tensions is not a decline in trade with China, but yes, a change in, already quite marked, in purchases by China of government bonds in the US. There's a retrenchment, a less appetite to buy the government bonds of Western countries, or at least for now in the US. What you see also is that with quantitative tightening, but especially the shifts in demographics as the aging become aged, less demand for the government bonds that we had before, at the same time as we have more government bonds on account of the post-pandemic spending. And thirdly, we have now a big investment boom on both sides of the Atlantic associated with the climate transition and both on the public and the private side. All three factors pushing towards a shrinkage of the gap and an increase in our star. So let me finish then with numbers, as I promised, and also because I've mentioned so many things that by now it's important to bring them together. Risk premium on inflation are up by somewhere between 0.1 and 0.25%. Expected inflation is not up by 1%. A lot of it was the liquidity risk, but it is up by somewhere between 0.2 and 0.5, especially when you to account right tail on disagreement, like in Anna's points. The return given bonds, if you add up those three and, show, and put in models that I didn't show you in my 12 minutes, which I've already pushed beyond, I'm already at 14, um, up by somewhere between 0 0.7 and 1.5. And so what we have is that the I star, if you want, is higher by somewhere between two and three percent, uh, somewhere between one, sorry, percent and two, or a little bit more than two percent higher. That means that the current long run value of where nominations are going to be is somewhere between two, two and a half, and three and a half percent. And so for current 3.75, depending on how pessimistic you want to be on my confidence band, Maybe this is the new normal, because the upper bound is something like a three and a half, or again, a lower bound more like a two, 225. I want to finish though with one point, which is that of course, this is endogenous. If a central bank thinks that it has, it's going to end up at three and a half versus it's going to end up at 2%, that's going to matter insofar as whether it thinks that right now it should raise rates a lot more or a lot less, given that we are not at the long run and inflation is above target. But note that if you go through all the many, many points that I threw at you in the last 14 minutes, in all of them, inflation risk premium, expected inflation, the pressure there is to insure against that expected inflation, and even the liquidity and safety of nominal government bonds, in all of them, current policy, current monetary policy, and the success in fighting inflation will affect those. And so in the end, even as we assess the long run I star, we find ourselves chasing that I star. And the short run rates that we set today, and especially our ability to control inflation, will determine whether that I star turns out to be higher and adds a model endogenous theory component to where that will end up. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ricardo. Well, we started a bit late, so we have around nine minutes. And I want to give you each a chance to reflect on each other's views. But since we don't have time then to take questions, I would like to take two questions beforehand. And then I'll give you each a few minutes to reflect on what has been said in the panel and to the questions as well. OK, so maybe we can take two questions from the floor, if there are any. Thank you, Ricardo, for, and all of you for excellent presentations. Um, Klaus Schmidt-Hebel from Chile. A uh, brief question on um, temporary shocks vis-a-vis -vis permanent policy responses. What if um, the shock is temporary? The inflation shock, the inflation expectation shock, the increase, the ultimate increase in I-star, which you advocate, just fades away as inflation is back to more normal, I don't say 2%, 1%, but more normal than what we have seen in the last 24 months. We have one more question, and then... Uh, 
is a European Central Bank a winner of inflation because of senior rates, income has maybe increased because the value of money which have supplied has decreased. And second, European Central Bank has very a lot of uh, state debt papers. And when the value of state debt has decreased, European Central Bank has, I think, profited. Have you calculations how much European Central Bank has been profited from this big inflation? Okay, thank you. So let me give you each a few minutes to reflect on each other and to address the questions. We'll do it in the same order. So Anna, Pablo, and Ricardo. Well, thank you. Um, I was very much appreciative of the way that Pablo went through the different channels very systematically. And I'd just like to highlight, I didn't even attempt to go there, but even if I had, we can't because we don't have disaggregated wealth data in Sweden. So when the um, property tax and the wealth tax was taken away, all the data disaggregated on households were taken away. And I just like, and this is not the right forum to do sort of political lobbying, but trust me, when we have this kind of shock to inflation and increasing the policy rate at a fast pace, and at the same time, we can't actually look through this in a systemic way because the data has been taken away. That's a little bit of a scandal, I think. So thank you for uh, going through that. And I had to say, state it because it's a big frustration for us. The other thing I'd like to point out um, is just when we look across different households, you mentioned that poorer households, and you can show that in your data, were affected the most. But there's more effects on poorer households than, than you get just from their pure consumption baskets. And that's the dynamic effects, the fact that poor households can't change their consumption patterns as much as richer households. They can't invest in energy saving. They can't substitute an expensive brand for a, for a, for a cheaper brand. So there are all these kind of effects. And I think it's also interesting to see some research because it will affect consumption patterns going forward. Uh, that's very short comments, but thank you. Mm. Uh, well, thank you. I will, I will make three comments on uh, Anna's and um, Ricardo's presentation, and I will also touch the second part of your second question. Um, so, not that I disagree. On the contrary, I want to maybe to emphasize three issues that uh, were mentioned one uh, by, by two by, by Ricardo, one by Anna. Uh, I mean, first, perhaps uh, coming back to Ricardo's presentation, uh, I cannot more than agree, and this is very important, that uh, when uh, analyzing from the uh, monetary policy per perspective uh, inflation expectations calculated by market is absolutely crucial to clean this data uh, of uh, the risk premium and the liquidity premium and uh, the, re the results that you get uh, uh, Ricardo in terms of of course uh, this morning for example these swaps were uh, leading to an inflation expectation uh, for the, the five, uh, five year and five year for, for the euro area of around 2.6, between 2.5 and 2.6. Um, if you eliminate the risk premium, which is positive um, uh, nowadays, then um, the inflation expectations uh, driven by uh, calculated uh, with, this, uh, with this number is very close to 2%. And this is why we at the ECB uh, remain confident uh, that uh, inflation expectations are anchored which doesn't mean that the risk premium component uh, is not informative in itself. It has changed a lot. I mean, um, if you look at the, at the numbers uh, four years ago before this inflation episode uh, uh, took place, this risk premium uh, was even negative. So the fact that now it's positive and, it's, uh, I mean the, and, the, and the, the absolute value is, is, is high is informative of the uncertainty that the markets have. And of course, that this uncertainty goes in the direction that they might expect higher inflation in the, in the future, which of course is also important from the perspective of, the, of, the, of monetary policy making. Then, uh, second, on this issue of our star, uh, I buy completely, uh, Ricardo, and I, I would say that this is the main argument that I buy nowadays on why our star might have increased that uh, this is due uh, not to demographics. I, I haven't seen any change uh, in demographics 
in the last three years, apart, of course, for the dramatic bleak of the, of the, of the pandemic. Um, but, I mean, the evolution of um, um, dependency ratios, etc., were completely uh, anticipated before this ha have not changed. Productivity, that was the second argument that uh, was given in order to justify lower star. Um, uh, I mean, we might expect higher productivity because of uh, international uh, uh, artificial intelligence, we'll see. At the same time, there are some factors like as the globalization that might go even in the opposite uh, direction, so we'll see. But uh, the fact that we have higher uh, public debt, um, both in emerging and, of course, in developed uh, economies, so the stock is, is higher, and there are some arguments in the supply and demand of, of, this, um, of these bonds that might have changed that could lead to a higher R star. Whether, uh, I mean, on the precise uh, um, estimates that you provide, I mean, we can, we can discuss, but uh, I think this is a point that... Um, that, uh, that is absolutely uh, valid, um, and uh, which, in any case, from the perspective, again, of uh, monetary policy, I mean, you compare uh, the, the other stars that you uh, estimate today uh, as to the numbers uh, of the uh, official interest rates of the ECB, uh, I think we can still keep uh, this sentence that um, our monetary policy is uh, nowadays in restrictive territory, which is, of course, uh, uh, also very, very important. Um, then one, uh, one uh, issue about uh, Anna's presentation, uh, I, again, uh, it's just a confirmation that I think that uh, inflation expectations are very relevant, in particular, as you said, because um, it's crucial for the credibility of the central bank. To a certain extent, inflation expectations are an instrument of the transmission of, of, monetary, of monetary policy. Um, and this is why it's so uh, relevant that we communicate, uh, in particular with, uh, with, the, with the public, but also that we act. Uh, because, uh, of course, we know that um, an important, um, there is a, a clear correlation be between the increase in inflation expectations of households and the observed inflation that they, that, that, that they have. So it's not com I, communication might not be uh, sufficient uh, in some cases, or in particular in, in these uh, episodes. No? And then finally, on, the, um, on this question on uh, public debt, uh, uh, central banks, uh, etc., well, maybe uh, two considerations. First, um, this idea that an increase uh, or a tightening of monetary policy uh, or in higher inflation, sorry, leads to, uh, I'm basically using my argument of the wealth effect, to lower um, uh, real, real debt and that then the, the government benefits uh, from it. I mean, it's true, uh, I mean, if, if the effects, you take it the effect for one year and it's a transitory effect, effect on inflation. But in this inflation episode leads to higher interest rates because the inflation episode persists then the, the evidence that you have is that through this increase in interest rates, the net effect of all this into public debt, into public deficit first, and then into public debt is even negative. And then second, on the impact on, on, of the, the current tightening on central banks, well, in terms of the profit and loss accounts of, uh, of our balance sheet, uh, you perfectly know that many central banks will enter into negative uh, territory. So there will be also a, a negative impact on the public deficit of uh, many countries because the central banks will not be in a position to, uh, to, 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 to transmit you know, the, these revenues to, 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 to governments. Thank you, Paula. Ricardo, you can close in uh, three minutes. <laughs> okay, four points in three minutes reacting to the previous two talks, but mostly without Anna and Pablo as my audience, but you as my audience. First, on expectations, Anna summarized very clearly how much we've learned, how useful it's been. I want to leave you, the researchers in the room, with a question that I think is absolutely central for Anna and Pablo, and which I don't feel confident at all in, and you should research, which is, at what point, as we think about bringing inflation down, as we're bringing it down, does it make a difference if we are four years above 2% versus five years versus three years? In other words, what should be our sense of urgency? Now, obviously, communication should shape expectations. Expectations disagree, different agents disagree. But to what extent is it as we start trying to converge too slowly from the up to back to 2%, this starts becoming entrenched in that people stop not trusting you, they start saying, I don't care about communication anymore, it's now been two, three, four years of inflation above. I don't have a good answer for that, I have some models that give me some answers, but that I think is a fundamental question on expectations. For the next question, uh, no, we don't have. Second, on, um, um, oh, I got this on my hand right uh, well, let me go to Klaus uh, first. I think you, you put very well, I think, the question that I posed of, um, sorry, of the endogeneity of the I-star. I think, again, it goes back to, I think there's a natural tendency in the literature in economics to, in monetary economics, to say we want to smooth interest rates towards the target. 
But there's also arguments to actually overshoot as opposed to smooth, precisely insofar as that overshooting can change the long run target. And so when you ask how transitory or how temporary it's going to be, uh, my answer is precisely, well, um, that is an endogenous object. And absolutely, if we are more successful or maybe overshoot, then maybe that I star will end up being, lo being lower to start with. So I think sometimes overshooting is seen as a failure. In monetary economics, there's many ways. Certainly the Taylor principle teaches us it's not. Overshooting is actually the right thing to do, uh, both on interest rate and actually on inflation. And, but that's a different discussion. On seniorage and the, the losses of central banks, um, let me just note that if you think of seniorage as the printout from currency, it is a fact that as inflation rises, that tends to increase. But that elasticity, which I estimated some years ago, is very small. In other words, the idea of let's print money to pay for the government's expenses, a very bad idea that has many centuries of history, is okay if you print to get 50% inflation, and then you get a couple, maybe four or five percent of GDP. The going a little bit higher like we did now temporarily gives you very little insinuage. And when you look at the asset side, what you have instead is that um, the ECB for the last six, seven years, by buying long-term bonds, had made extraordinary profits. The ECB made very large profits, which distributed as large dividends to those same governments. This year, the other side, the ECB is not a particularly good investor. It doesn't try to be a good investor or to time the market. It's making the losses. If you average over the last seven, eight years, the ECB has essentially made no particular profits. I hope that governments don't overreact to the losses of this year or next year. The government's got perhaps too many dividends. I think Lichter has argued that central banks should have had been able to provision more in the last few years than they did, but laws prevented them not to. The other side of it now is to, uh, that there will be some losses this year and next year. I think on av there will be no dividends paid to governments, but on average, it will And then I'll end up with, although Pablo already mentioned this, which is why I skipped to the fourth point, which is that from the perspective of economic theorists here in the room, uh, the last two years of inflation, if you think about it, we had a pandemic with a gigantic amount of spending. And when we have a gigantic amount of spending, used to be with wars, this time was a war against a pandemic, yeah, you get a burst of inflation that inflates away a little bit of the debt. We even have work going back to Lucas and Soka that says that's actually optimal. So let's also not overreact about the fact that we had a little bit of inflation. That's actually optimal public finance theory uh, that that happened. It is part of paying away the debt to inflate a little bit. But as Lucas Stokey theory teaches us, and as the experience of countries like Spain and Portugal and others teaches us, and that was the point that Pablo made, but I really want to repeat it to emphasize it. And anticipated inflation can be an okay way to do public finances every 50 years when you fight a war. But if it becomes anticipated inflation, if central banks lose credibility, if we start expecting inflation, that increases the burden of, of, uh, uh, on the government, that increases the cost of public finance, and that increases the distortions with it. And that is why so it was so important to have an independent central bank with an inflation target, ensuring that these things happen once every 20 or 30 years in an unexpected way, but on average, we can rely on the central bank to deliver 2% inflation, and why it's so important to keep to that target. Okay, thank you very much. L join me with a round of applause.